this is intended to be used by folks who have not used distance before. If you have used distance, you will recognize most of what I'm going to say. The history of date, distance dates back not quite to the Dark Ages, but um, to about the late 1970s. I won't go through the entire history of that, but you can see that it's gone through quite a substantial set of changes over time. It received quite active development during the late 1990s and early 2000s, and we've continued to add features to it during the decade of the 2000s into the current decade up to the present day. Um, we have a very active software development program. Um, we have a GitHub repository, if that means anything to you, and you will see uh, quite a few changes in distance in the coming months and years. Not only does our software continue to develop, but the number of people that use distance or the number of people that download distance has continues to increase on an almost exponential scale. We've had over 30,000 downloads up until now. And um, we ask people to tell us where they're from, and we registered well over 100 countries from which people have downloaded distance since we started keeping records. The last time we took a summary of where people, what sort of things people used distance to analyze, we found that the vast majority of them were biologists that worked in the terrestrial realm on terrestrial birds and mammals, but many of you fall into these other categories, and I think this reflects perhaps the number of biologists in these relative fields rather than necessarily applicability of distance sampling methods. What I, the main thing that this short discussion is intended to try to describe to you is where can you go to find out more about how to use the distance software if you're not coming on our workshops or if you need a short refresher having been on our workshops. And it, comes as, it should come as no surprise to you that uh, software, just like any software, distance comes with an extensive set of manuals. And those manuals live either in uh, a form of HTML that's available uh, from inside the software itself, or that self-same information lives in a PDF version. The PDF version of this user's guide has now sprouted to over 300 pages. So there's a, a highly condensed amount of information about the use of program distance that resides in um, online sources. In addition to that, you can also get help about using distance by joining a email list and we've just changed this email list in the spring of 2014 to be hosted by Google in a Google group and so if you want to join at that Google group this is what you do you send an email with no subject and no message to that address you'll get a confirmation from Google if you don't, if you aren't used to getting email from Google, it might end up in your junk mail folder, so take a look to see if it's in your spam folder. Um, that Google list, even though it's new since 2014, it contains, it's, been, it's had all of our previous information shipped into it, and so you'll find email messages dating all the way back to 1998, and they can be searched because it's hosted by Google. In addition to that, we also have an, a new and active homepage. It's much easier to remember than the old homepage address. It's simply distance sampling, all one word, dot org. And you'll see there a, a revamped scenario of what our new and improved distance sampling page looks like. We have lots of plans to put active feeds on there, to have blogs on there, to have a tools and tips 
section. So we tend to make this we intend to make this a much more dynamic um, web presence than it's been in the past. So have a look. Let me turn my attention to distance projects and how the, how some of the internal structure of them look. You'll find if you if you build a project, you'll find a DST file named however you want to make it. And inside that DST file, which is known as the distance extension, so your program distance will look for DST files when you ask to open a project. That file will contain information about the designs that your survey used, the surveys themselves, the analyses you performed, the model definitions, the data filters, all of the things that you've used to describe the analyses that you wish to perform. Curiously, what that file does not contain is it does not contain any of your data. Your data live in an access database called disk data with an MDB extension. And that lives, along with a number of other things, in a folder which has the same prefix as the name of your project with a .dat extension. In addition to your data, there may also be shape files. There may also be workspaces that are created by the R programming language. There's a host of things that go on behind the scenes of information that's created when you perform distance analyses. Most of that, all of that, is transparent to you, the user, and you needn't know very much about it, except when it comes time to wanting to archive that information, to store it away, to share that information with colleagues. You'll need to know that you can't simply send myproject.dst and expect your colleagues to be able to do anything with it. So as I say, the creation of all of that structure is transparent when you ask distance to create a project or to open a project. All of that information and all of that structure is created by the program itself. However, as I said, if you want to exchange distance information with others, you'll need to make sure that all of, all of the bits and pieces of that information get transmitted. And to do that, the best thing to do is to use the export feature of program distance. So you say file export the project as a zip file. And then all of the bits and pieces of distance that I described earlier will go into a single zip, zip archive file. The recipient of that archive file can then open it inside distance because distance knows what an archive file is and how to reconstruct a distance project from an archive file. So simply let distance do that work for you. A bit more about the internal structure of how distance holds on to your data in a distance project. The data are stored in layers. And a typical distance project has information in four layers. The topmost layer, these layers are hierarchical, the topmost layer is called the global layer and it contains information about your study area. Your study area may be broke down, broken down into regions or strata. Each of those regions or strata will have points or lines associated with them, and so we call those samples, and so that information lives at the sample layer. How many transects did you have? What were those transects named? How long were each of those transects? That information lives in the sample layer. And finally, we get to the bottommost layer called the observation layer, and that is where the actual sighting information resides, because the sightings such as I saw a bird at a perpendicular distance of 27 meters on transect 3, has information that is relevant to what was the transect that that belonged to, in what stratum did that transect belong, and in where in my study area did that take place. So, if you commonly work with GIS data, then this idea of layers is very comfortable to you. 
And what I want to stress is that there's a hierarchy associated with information that resides in these different layers. Those layers are maintained or represented when you look at the data tab in your project browser. You'll see information about the global layer, the strata layers, the sample layer, and the observation layer. And so here again you see the hierarchical nature of the database that contains your distance project information. Each of those layers is then comprised of fields. So each field for in a, from a database perspective, each of those fields needs to have a name, and they also need to have, they also need to identify the type of data that they contain. Do they contain numbers? Do they contain numbers with or without decimal points? Do they contain characters? And so you'll see that there's information not only about the layer, but the name of the field in the layer, the type of information contained in that field, and then if the, if the information in those fields have measurement units, then that's also recorded, nautical miles, square meters, things like that. So, to place the information into this hierarchical database, Distance has ways of helping you do that. It has a data entry wizard, it has a data import wizard, and it also has this thing called an explorer that will let you look at the structure of the project. That's, an, that's a quick summary of data structures. In addition to that, there are once you have the data in some sort of a structure, you'll then need to analyze them. The nature of an analysis can be fairly sophisticated and fairly complex. This particular screen capture shows you lots of things going on inside an analysis. There's a project browser that contains a summary of the information. You can then have multiple analyses open simultaneously. You can see analysis 17 as well as analysis 19 are on display here for you to compare and contrast. And there are also additional windows that will allow you to look at uh, which models you have defined and which models have been put to use in analyses. In addition to survey, in addition to analysis of surveys, Distance also has a survey design engine that allows you to create survey designs that tell you where to go in your study area to the, facilitate the data collection process. And so here you see an example, again, of a project browser describing a number of different survey designs, and again, a comparison of survey number 12 with design number 15, highlighting the characteristics of both the surveys and the designs that led to the surveys. Hope that's helpful for you.